I wanted to welcome everyone here. I'm Gary Simpson, the Dean of the Law School. Uh, and this is one of the three lectures each year that's sponsored by the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Conflict and Dispute Resolution. Uh, and this is their interdisciplinary lecture. Uh, the history of this center. The first was Maya Angelou, and we wanted to wait for a uh, someone of, of uh, great stature to follow her, and, and we found Stephen Post here. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at Stony Brook University uh, and head of the Division of Medicine and Society. Uh, until this past July, he was the professor of bioethics, family medicine, philosophy, and religion uh, in the medical school here at this university uh, and had been here for 20 years. He's widely recognized for his research on compassionate love face of science, ethics, religious thought, and behavioral medicine. He has a PhD from the University of Chicago uh, in 1983. Uh, he was the founding president of the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love, Altruism, Compassion, and Service, uh, which is uh, founded in 2001. Uh, that uh, institute funds more than 70 scientific studies at universities. He has written seven scholarly books on altruism and love. Uh, he's editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of Bioethics. Uh, his most recent book, this one here, uh, Why Good Things Happen to Good People, or Have Your Life by the Simple Act of Giving. Uh, so let me introduce now uh, our sister speaker, uh, Stephen Post. He had met Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., that he has devoted most of his life to being a housing activist and community organizer, and that his wife passed away some years ago. Jim read me the following forgiveness statement, which he brought to the courthouse in Harrisburg that next morning. After all these years of languishing in legal limbo, the perpetrator was about to be sentenced. Now I read from Jim LaRue's statement, which has been published nationally in a number of major newspapers. Resentencing statement for Paul David Cruz, 12 2106 Paul, early in the morning of September 13, 1990, you tortured, raped, and murdered my daughter Molly. The hole in my heart from her loss remains. But I'm here today because I'm very pleased that your death sentences have been replaced with life imprisonment without chance of parole. However horrible your actions, I do not believe in the death penalty, which is an act of vengeance, even if it is state authorized. Vengeance is never an answer to anything. It only breeds more violence and more retribution. And so, Paul, I am here today to offer you forgiveness for what you have done. I wish that you and I can now find peace. What do I ask of you for this offering of forgiveness? Nothing, 
It is freely given. But I do offer you a suggestion. With the death penalty no longer hanging over you, I hope that you will be able to find a significant meaning in your life. Your mind and spirit can never be imprisoned. There are a growing number of serial killers in the country. My family has always believed that discovering the pain and fear that caused the violence could foster understanding and make us all more genuinely human. I hope that you will consider accepting counsel from those who can help you understand what caused you to commit acts of violence and how you might help other troubled people. Molly had decided to devote her life to working with troubled children, like you certainly were. She was determined to find out why these kids acted out in terribly violent ways. She was convinced that if you could reach them at an early enough stage of their development, they could find their way through the circumstances that seemed to be driving them to violent ends. She would have wanted that for you. Paul, I think it would be great if you could pick up where Molly left off, starting with yourself. Help the Mollies of this world learn who you are and try to enlist the help of other inmates to help in this effort. You are a gold mine of critical information that needs to be unearthed. I can assure you, Paul, that Molly will be with you every step of the way because this is how much she cares. Peace be with you, peace be with you, Jim LaRue, Molly's dad. I recall watching uh, Jim head off in his car that evening uh, from uh, Starbucks, and I believe the next morning he was uh, out on uh, Route 76 uh, headed for, uh, for Harrisburg. He wasn't just doing some internal meditational exercise, but he was pursuing a course of action sustained by spiritual practices, actions that were a social reality requiring time, energy, and presence. I'd like to ask Jim, who's here, if you'd just stand up for a moment. I think we'd like to give you a note of applause, actually. And uh, I asked Jim earlier uh, in the foyer um, if um, he might be willing to share with us the comment uh, from the uh, judge in Harrisburg, uh, which followed uh, the reading of your statement. Prosecutor. We thank you for being here, uh, and I know this now is the the 18th anniversary of Molly's passing last week, so we sympathize with you and our hearts are with you. Um, forgiveness, revenge, reconciliation, these are not abstractions. They have to do with people's lives. I'm going to talk a bit with you about science and humanities and even spirituality. But in the end, these kinds of behaviors are not taught by didactic lectures. Uh, they're not taught by uh, empirical studies. But they're transmitted from one human being to another. So for me, the very fact that I could uh, sit with Jim and get to know Jim over the years uh, has been really, for me, a source of tremendous growth. And I thank you for that. OK. Uh, Confucius wrote, if you devote your life to seeking revenge, first dig two graves. Leviticus 19.18, the first time in the world literature that the idea of loving your neighbor is articulated, it's important to realize it's not just love your neighbor as yourself, but there's something that comes before it. You shall not seek vengeance or bear a grudge, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The argument there, the dynamic is that this rage within us can't be stilled easily, that it takes an equally powerful and perhaps more powerful emotion to quiet it and to allow us to move forward. 
And that emotion, in my view, and I think in all of our views, uh, is love. I'll tell you a little story that's in Why Good Things Happen to Good People. Uh, about four years ago, I happened to be at a business meeting in New York. It was in the late afternoon. It was hotter than could be. It was late August. I think it must have been 100 degrees out. The meeting wasn't going anyplace but I couldn't vote with my feet and not insult the donors who were in my presence. Well, lo and behold, nine o'clock rolled around and I'd missed my flight from LaGuardia back to Cleveland. I had a lecture the next morning at eight o'clock on compassion in the brain for the medical students. I wasn't going to miss that. So I walked over fast as I could to the Port Authority building and I got in a bus. Well, the first thing that happened was the driver turns around and he says, sorry folks, Air conditioners busted. Do you really want to go to Cleveland? Everybody grudgingly said yes. We got out of that bus. Uh, I'm sorry, out of that uh, Port Authority terminal. Um, interestingly enough, five minutes into the trip, I felt a slight tapping on my shoulder. Uh, I turned around, and there in the seat behind me was a young guy about 18 years old, 20 years old, with the facial configuration of a person with Down syndrome. And he asked me in this wonderfully warm, loving, generous tone, sir, are we in Cleveland yet? <laughs> I turned around, I looked at him and I said, no, but I'll let you know when we get there. Well, he couldn't retain things very well. So literally every five minutes across Jersey, Pennsylvania, he would ask me this question and I would respond. It kept me up all night. But what a tremendous emotional contrast between that fellow behind me and the guy sitting in front of me. He had two little boys by his side. They might have been five and six years old. And about every half hour, he'd jump up in a rage of hostility, pound his fist into the metal ceiling above, and yell out an expletive, frightening everybody aboard. Well, guess what? About 4 a.m., we got into Milesburg, Pennsylvania. That's exit 58 on Route 80, in case you're interested. And its only claim to fame is, I think, is that there is a stopover for Trailways buses. So everybody got out of the bus. And lo and behold, the security wouldn't allow this fellow and his two little boys back aboard. So my last very sad vision is of this fellow kicking the side of the wall and his two little boys in tears, marooned in Milesburg. Well, we get on Route 80, the fellow behind me taps me on the shoulder again. Sir, are we in Cleveland? We got into Cleveland about 7 in the morning. I made my lecture. I gave this fellow a hug in the uh, a Greyhound station downtown here. I uh, met his parents, by the way. And the moral of the story is, uh, if you want to get to Cleveland, hostility won't do it. <laughs> it's that simple. Um, this fellow was rage on wheels. Uh, he was utterly unforgiving of his situation. Uh, he was seeking revenge in all these completely unconstructive ways, uh, and he wound up uh, in Milesburg, and as far as I know, he's already, uh, he's still there. I, I have no idea. Um, you know, we've got to think about um, human nature with great care. Um, the philosopher Plato said the most important first question in all philosophical thought is know thyself, <clears throat> and I think that's really true. Are we creatures of Revenge? Are we creatures of forgiveness and reconciliation? Are we some combination of the two? How do we want to think about what we are? I recall uh, being a high school kid up in New Hampshire, um, and my uh, philosophy teacher had us all read Robert Ardrey's The Territorial Imperative, which was about uh, non human primates. And Ardrey talked exclusively about innate aggression, right? There was nothing very good in primate uh, nature. Uh, just uh, transposing this to human nature was a little bit like reading uh, Lord of the Flies, which tells you with all certainty that if you put a few boys on an island, they'll certainly torture and kill the one person who has the least bit of kindness. Uh, I don't believe those things, but that was the temper of the time. So innate aggression, the great British philosopher Murray Midgley referred to this period of primatology as swashbuckling, <laughs> these swashbuckling visions of gorillas and so forth. Uh, 
Franz Duval, uh, probably the greatest primatologist of, uh, of our time, who runs the Yerkes uh, Institute at uh, Emory University, in 1975 had a tremendously deep, and he would call it, if you will, spiritual experience, defined very broadly. He was in the Arnhem Zoo. He thought to himself, fires start, but fires also go out. Obvious as this is, scientists concerned with aggression, a sort of social fire, have totally ignored the means by which the flames of aggression are extinguished. Well, Duval went on to study cooperative behavior, forgiving behavior, reconciliatory behavior in primates. Uh, uh, he's uh, rumored to be on the very short list for the Nobel Prize. And his books, uh, for example, The Ape Within, uh, have been bestsellers, really trying to give us an alternative to this extraordinarily bleak uh, and pseudoscientific pessimism about the human capacity for forgiveness and reconciliation. So we need to know ourselves, and one of the ways that we know ourselves more clearly is by looking at those species that immediately uh, precede us in evolution. Now, another point of clarification. Today, in a university like Case Western, but anywhere in the country, the social sciences, as well as evolutionary biology, uh, economics, cognitive science, they're all based, in large part, on game theories. I won't go into what game theories are. Uh, in law school, game theory is something that you study very seriously. When uh, people look at... Um, military uh, conduct uh, at uh, Annapolis or West Point, they study game theory. The dominant game theory that has won in all the computer uh, simulations is called tit for tat, uh, Rappaport's tit for tat. And here's how it goes. When you interact with another player, you begin with niceness. You begin optimistically, uh, hopeful for cooperation, if that other player defects, then you retaliate in some way. Call it an expression of anger. And when a player returns to cooperation, forgive, and you return to niceness. The point of tit for tat is that to be socially successful in any avenue of life, in any career, uh, as uh, an evolving species, uh, never bear a grudge because grudgers lose. Okay, Now, tit for tat was expanded upon by Martin Nowak and Carl Sigmund at Harvard. This is at the Harvard Game Theory Center on Brattle Street. Uh, they pointed out that oftentimes we confuse the cues that the other player is delivering. So we mistake cooperation and defection. We think someone is defecting when they're not. And so therefore, a game where you as a player forgive completely unconditionally, not even worrying about expressions of anger and the like, when you forgive unconditionally one third of the time due to error proneness, you uh, overwhelm tit for tat in its original sense. So what's become as important in social science today as the DNA molecule is in the biological sciences is this notion of generous tit for tat. Here's the natural law. It's the natural law of evolution, primate, but even more primitive forms of evolution. It's considered to be now a natural law of human interactions, at least according to uh, a great many uh, very sophisticated thinkers. All iterated or repeated interactions require forgiveness. It's not optional, it's required. And we are wired for forgiveness just as much as for retaliation. Forgiveness is perfectly natural, at least as much as revenge, and probably more. Now, you all grew up listening to uh, Alexander Pope and the poets. They said to err is human, to forgive is divine. Don't believe that. Hannah Arendt the great political scientist at Chicago, in the last lines of The Human Condition, perhaps the most important book ever written in American political science. She said, Jesus Christ created forgiveness in human culture. 
I would differ with this. I would simply say that as an aspect of human nature, every evolutionary and mathematical theory, every primatological theory we have now points out that this capacity to forgive is very much a part of what we, we are essentially as human beings. Now, let me just update you briefly in an area called affective neuroscience. Not that you need to remember this, but brain scientists describe what's called the seeking system in the caudate nucleus of the brain. And this is a system that is active while relationships are going smoothly, while you're in a cooperative uh, venue. Now, as soon as we are harmed, the seeking system shuts down. It's really dramatic. This is all studied in uh, magnetic resonance devices and so forth. It shuts down and we move to the brain's rage circuit. Walter Hess won the Nobel Prize. How? By defining the rage circuit. He applied electricity to a part of a cat hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is that deeply emotional part of the brain that's beneath the, the cortex and the neocortex. It's very, very primitive and early evolutionarily. You apply electricity to the hypothalamus and suddenly, bammo, you've created a snarling beast, claws are bare, hair is erect. But then, interestingly enough, the seeking system kicks back in in these models. Uh, revenge, the desire for revenge, is not the product of uh, uh, the rage circuit. It's actually a product of the seeking system. So people talk, it's interesting, linguistically, about craving revenge. Uh, and by the way, there is a gender difference. Uh, studies point out uh, that uh, uh, women are less likely to pursue revenge, and this is studied neurologically, uh, than men. And I won't go into that in depth. But let's just look at a statement from Mark Twain for a little historical wisdom. Revenge is wicked and unchristian and on everything else and in every way unbecoming, but it is powerful, sweet, anyway. That's what I mean here. There's a whole neurology now that people are working out. It's not just nascent science, but we're beginning to understand the circuitry involved. Uh, and in fact, there are people at the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute of Mental Health who are actually trying to develop a forgiveness pill. On some days, <laughs> we could all use it, I guess but it raises certain ethical issues. Forgiveness in the brain. Forgiveness is built in the same domains, both psychological and neurological, that we associate with compassionate love. In other words, what the neuroscience is telling us is that forgiveness is a modulation or an expression of other regarding love, that sense that we have uh, of empathy and compassion for others is what seems then to give rise to forgiveness. Uh, when we feel empathy for another, our mirror neurons, now this is new science kick in, and mirror neurons are really interesting. Uh, they seem, by the way, to be relatively uh, low in volume with young kids who have uh, autism. Mirror neurons are what allow us to actually feel into the emotional experience of another human creature. Uh, incidentally, uh, it is estimated that three percentage, uh, percent of us are uh, sociopaths. Uh, we're not all, by the way, serial killers. Some of us are CEOs, department heads, and so forth. I won't go into that. But the point is that, that uh, uh, you know, there, there, there are people who simply lack the apparatus for uh, what we would call the moral sentiments, to use the language of uh, uh, Adam Smith, uh, 10 years before he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Uh, Smith wrote uh, his theory of moral sentiments, all about uh, for these, 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 these connecting uh, experiences we have on an affective or an emotional uh, basis. Uh, but the point is, uh, in all of the research we have now, um, when uh, your mirror neurons are kicking in, when you're actually feeling empathy toward a perpetrator, it is hard to maintain a vengeful attitude. Um, forgiveness and reconciliation, I might say, approach universality. For those of you interested in cultural anthropology, you can ask, well, are forgiveness and reconciliation uh, strictly culturally relative? No, they're actually uh, 
uh, universal. In fact, scientists say that when you get a 95% uh, read, uh, that's as good as saying that something is, in fact, uh, ubiquitous. So uh, it seems to be the case that we have this kind of mechanism for forgiveness, uh, which is based on contact and empathy. You know, Jim LaRue uh, went to Harrisburg and encountered uh, a perpetrator. And in that encounter uh, and in the letter, the statement that he read, there was every kind of imaginable expression of empathy. Uh, he understood uh, this person's uh, uh, history. As the Germans would say, this was Verstehen, understanding. That doesn't excuse, but it helps us to understand. And in fact, one of Sister Helen Prejean's argument against the death penalty is that as soon as someone is gone from the face of the earth, we no longer have the opportunity ourselves to develop uh, the kind of freedom uh, and alleviation that comes with uh, forgiveness because they're no longer available to us. Now, I'm going to talk for a minute about health. I'm going to try to play uh, doctor. Uh, I am a professor of preventive medicine, uh, technically right now at Stony Brook, so I'll play with this. In 1936, there was a psychiatrist, a young psychiatrist up in Canada at McGill University, and he wanted to do some research. Most of modern neuroscience was born at McGill and the University of Montreal. He couldn't find a thoughtful project to study. But here's the trick. Hans Selye really had a phobia about rats. When he handled them, he would quickly throw them against the, the wall of the cage. Uh, he, would, he, 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 he was just constantly tossing them around because he was so frightened and perturbed by rats. And his rats started dying. In fact, a third of his rats died in one year. They were just gone. And across the hallway, there was a, a, a lab, and there was a, a, a lab assistant there who just loved rats. In fact, she fondled them. She kept them, some of them in her pocket and brought them out and would pet them. These were nice white rats, you know, and good rats. And, and she, she loved them, and, and um, uh, they were cute, and her rats were thriving. Well, Selye finally has something worth studying. <clears throat> so here's what he did. He looked at these rats. Of course, he didn't particularly like rats anyway, so maybe he had an easy time dissecting them. I don't know. But here's what he found out. When he looked at their adrenal glands, those are the glands that are on top of your kidneys, uh, they uh, produce and then um, uh, disseminate a hormone which a lot of you are familiar with. It's called cortisol. It's a stress hormone. It's great in short bursts under fight-flight conditions. You see a snake in the grass or you're in a conflict scenario. Uh, it uh, uh, changes your metabolism, uh, your metabolite system. You uh, are getting a lot of energy uh, out of fatty acids now that are being pumped into your bloodstream. So it's very good in short doses. But over the long haul, it actually fills up your arteries, uh, uh, destroys your vascular system, and is generally unproductive. So these rats that were stressed out had adrenal glands that were three times the size of normal rat adrenals. And then he looked at the lymphatic system of these rats, which is the basis of the immune system. And what did he find? The volume of the lymphatic system was about one-third that of a normal rat lymph system. So they weren't producing antibodies. They were subject to uh, 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 infections at much higher rates than unstressed rats. Uh, Selye wrote a book uh, called The Stress of Life uh, in the 1950s, and he suggested that emotions like hostility, rumination, and so forth were very destructive because they would elicit this stress response, but love, goodwill, gratitude, optimism, and so forth would be good for you. Um, let me pursue that a little further. We have here with us Maria Pagano. Uh, who is a researcher of great distinction. She studies the 12-step program. One of the things that Maria has found is that when people fulfill the 12th step, which means you're reaching out in compassion and concern to someone else with your problem of alcoholism, when you fulfill that 12th step, 
you have about twice the likelihood of a successful recovery after one year. If you fulfill the 12th step, your recovery rate is about 40%. If you don't fulfill the 12th step and help another person with your problem, your recovery rate is a mere 22%. And of course, in this context is all the dynamics of self-forgiveness. You want to make a sincere apologies to people you've hurt. Uh, it's not easy uh, to forgive self. And helping others uh, is actually one interesting avenue toward self-acceptance. Paul Tillich, the great theologian, said the fundamental spiritual problem for all of us is the courage to be. How do we accept our existence when we know we fall so short of whatever our moral and spiritual ideals might be? And so there you have it, this self-forgiveness that's emerging from generative giving, helping activities. And it actually is tremendously important from the perspective of recovering from uh, uh, an addiction. Um, now here's another little bit of scientific evidence. The most famous what's called prospective longitudinal study in American history began at Berkeley in the Institute for Human Development in the 1920s where they started following 300 preteens. Now they follow these people every few years. Teams of researchers interview, they do psychological assessments, they look at uh, uh, medical records, they do physical exams. Well, lo and behold, uh, that one-third of these teams who early in life identified things like forgiveness, gratitude, compassion as important in their lives over the entire course of their lives. First of all, they were shielded from depression at dramatic rates. They were shielded from anxiety at dramatic rates. They were shielded from uh, vascular disease at dramatic rates. And now that they are in their 90s, there are about 200 or a little less who are still alive, actually. Um, the ones who, in fact, indicated early in life these positive pro-social emotions are much more thickly represented in that group than those early in life who did not, in fact, have the opportunity to express and cultivate those kinds of emotions. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that forgiveness is something that sheds a halo over our lives year after year after year, our whole life long. Now, let's look at MS patients. Here's a study out of Harvard University. This is Carolyn Schwartz. Looking at MS patients. Now, as MS patients, uh, when you look at their profiles, they typically have tremendous resentment. Why is this happening to me? They're looking at a kind of intractable progression and deterioration. Uh, the resentment, the hostility is very profound. The ones who are trained simply to make brief 15-minute compassionate phone calls to other people with MS have, quote, pronounced improvement in self-confidence, self-awareness, self-esteem, lower depression, and role functioning. And this, by the way, has been replicated several times. Let's look at HIV, a remarkable study from Gail Ironson at the University of Miami. People on the three-drug cocktail who report pro-sociality, who are helping other people in various ways, uh, not just people with AIDS, but who generally report high generativity in their lives, have lower levels of stress hormones, cortisol, and epinephrine. So this becomes very interesting. Let's think about it psychologically. You know, uh, let's talk about depression for a minute. In the 1960s, um, uh, the asylums, of course, were associated with warehousing, and we had the benefit of reading Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But if you go back earlier in history, in American history, to the 1820s, actually the asylums began as part of the moral treatment movement. A Quaker doctor in Philadelphia named Thomas Scattergood decided that you should treat people with depression and other mental illnesses with compassion, with kindness, with generosity. You shouldn't leave them locked in, in dank basements with metallic collars around their necks piercing into the skin under the Newtonian philosophy of mental illness that somehow it is due to the slowing of some otherwise unspecified fluid in the body. They decided we would treat people with respect. They unchained the melancholics. And then they actually hired the fellow who designed Grand Central Park uh, in, um, in New York. Uh, all of the great 
six sister asylums on the East Coast, McLean and Harvard, the Connecticut Asylum, now the Institute for Living in Hartford, the Philadelphia Asylum. They all had hundreds of acres, sweeping hills. They had cows, they had wheat fields. And what happened was these people uh, with these problems were encouraged to go out and do pro-social things. Bale the hay, milk the cows, paint the barn. Um, it was a way of tapping into their generous and altruistic capacities. Um, this apparently was quite effective. Uh, and it actually resurged in the 1960s in the clubhouse movement. Uh, here, actually, in University Circle, we have the Magnolia Clubhouse, which is just a few blocks away from the VA hospital. And it's associated with uh, the uh, 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 University Hospital's Department of Psychiatry, as well as uh, the uh, School of Social Work, MSAS. Uh, and what happens? Well, people with depression don't live in the Magnolia Clubhouse, but they come in every day and they do pro-social things. You know, do the shopping, um, uh, wash the dishes, do the cooking, uh, uh, cut the lawn, paint the room, etc. And it's really quite impressive uh, to look at some of these uh, outcomes. Uh, people couple this kind of pro-sociality with forgiveness therapy in these uh, 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 clubhouse movement homes, which are all over the country. So what I want to suggest then is that uh, uh, for people who are mildly or even moderately depressed, there's nothing much better than doing unto others. I'll go a little further now um, and talk about the heart. It's a wonderful uh, test that I think a lot of you in this room took once in your lives. Have you ever heard of the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory? How many have taken that? A lot of you, right? So I think it's about is it 400 questions. 350, it's close to that. It's a, it's a huge personality assessment. Uh, you, uh, you look at your strengths, some of your areas of weakness. You have some counseling around your, uh, your test outcomes. This has been in business since the 1930s. It's a quite reliable test. It's got a long history in American culture. Well, a cardiologist at Duke University named Redford B. Williams, one of the most well-known cardiologists alive, uh, picked 27 questions from that whole group of 350. And he called this set of questions the hostility scale. Included in it were rumination, tendency to ruminate, to just go back and invite back into your heart all the hurts that have occurred to you over the years. Uh, rumination, quickly agitated, uh, uh, prone to violence, uh, hot-tempered, etc. Uh, and, uh, and he looked at people in America who took the MMPI when they were 25 years of age, and it was 1950. And then he followed them for, uh, because the data was available until 1975 when they were 50 years of age. And guess what? Guess what? The ones who were in the top quadrant on hostility had a 20% death rate by age 50. One out of five were dead by age 50. Of what? Generally, cardiovascular illness, but they were also subject to a number of other stress-induced and related illnesses, including uh, diabetes, asthma, and so forth. How about those who were in the lowest quadrant on hostility? Their death rate at age 50 was a mere 2%. So Williams, as had Selye suggested earlier in 1936, uh, he suggested that, in fact, Rage, the desire for revenge, hostile emotions are like acid on metal. It's okay to be angry for a while. We should all be angry when we're hurt. We need to assert ourselves. But if that anger is turned on in a protracted way, over the long haul, it is like acid on metal of the body. So it actually changed American cardiology. When I was a boy growing up, people said, hey, don't uh, have a type A personality. They meant don't run around, don't multitask. Don't be doing some sort of New York strut from point A to point B all day, 24-7. But actually, no one really says that anymore. Uh, what they say is when this lecture is over and you've had a good reception and you're out on the boulevard here and you get to Euclid, there's all that construction there, and the person in front of you has the audacity to stop at a yellow light and you fall full-breasted on your horn and yell an expletive, you got a problem. Okay, So it's the hostility. Not the, uh, not the rapidity. Um, and of course, this has been corroborated uh, since then in Circulation, the main uh, journal in this area. 
Uh, and this is based on the national ARIC, the Ar uh, Arteriosclerosis Risk in Communities, 12,986 subjects. If you take middle-aged men and women uh, uh, of all races uh, and you look at them, uh, the ones who are high uh, in anger are three times more likely to suffer cardiac arrest than their less angry counterparts. Okay, so anger kills. Uh, at Stanford, you have the Forgiveness Institute, which has been making headlines around the world. Fred Luskin wrote that great book, Forgive for Good. He actually began his work studying Protestant and Catholic mothers of children killed in places like Belfast. By the way, studies indicate that Protestant and Catholic children hate each other by age four. And by the way, there are similar studies in the Middle East with Jews and Muslims. Um, so uh, he began studying these, um, uh, these women and examining their capacities for uh, forgiveness and reconciliation. He developed some forgiveness interventions, which I won't go into, but they were quite successful, and he found that they decreased anger, they increased hopefulness, they improved depression, they lowered blood pressure for most subjects, but not all, they improved relationships, and they enhanced self-reported I'm going to uh, make one other comment of a physiological sort. Uh, David McClellan, one of the star social psychologists of health of his generation at Harvard University, he had a control group that just watched of students at Harvard who watched neutral movies. I'll say potato peeling because I'm half Irish. And then he had the subject group watching a movie of Mother Teresa in Calcutta helping people. As the movie ended, he did the standard test of immune strength. You don't go for blood, you go for saliva. So he's looking at immunoglobulin A in the saliva. And what he found that there was a significant rise in ISGA in those who were watching the Mother Teresa film compared with the controls. And then he did something really fascinating. He took the subject group and he split it in two. And so he had half the subject group, the Mother Teresa group, meditate, or he called it dwell imaginatively, on generous giving to others. Okay, the other half didn't do that. Well, the ones who went through that kind of imaginative exercise actually uh, maintained that spike in ISGA, whereas the other group went back down to baseline. And this has been corroborated. It has been published in some of this kind of study in some of the finest journals that we have. Um, a few other quick points here. Um, in terms of the famous nun study, which occurred uh, uh, about 10 years ago and made the cover of Newsweek magazine. Does anyone remember the stories about the Alzheimer's nuns? Does anybody remember that? Okay, They're from Minneapolis, St. Paul. So Alzheimer's researchers decided they wanted to look at the brains by autopsy of nuns who had died, important caveat, by natural causes. Uh, to learn more about the actual uh, physiology of, of, of Alzheimer's. Um, that's really not relevant to us. What's so interesting is that Deborah Danner, a very distinguished researcher, went back and she looked at the essays that these nuns had written when they were young women, 18, 19, 20, and so forth, and they were applying into the order. They had to write very extensive autobiographical essays. Turns out that the ones who had high numbers of positive emotional words like forgiveness, gratitude, hope, compassion, and the like were living on average six to ten years longer than those who were using few or none of those words. So again, this suggests that there really is something to this notion of there being a halo over the course of a lifetime. Um, Stanford University researchers have found that generative giving behavior is associated with delayed mortality, also uh, decreased uh, rumination, uh, even when the effects of sociodemographics, medical and disability characteristics, and so forth are all taken into account and controlled for. There really is something to this. Now, again, the power of compassion and its relationship to forgiving. Mike McCullough has written this wonderful book, uh, uh, Beyond Revenge, uh, The Evolution of the Forgiveness Instinct, uh, Mike is an, 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 a very interesting guy. Um, just for your information, 
10 years ago, there were only 12 peer-reviewed scientific studies in all of Western literature on forgiveness. Think about all the thousands of studies we have on hostility, on anger, on fear, but on forgiveness, almost nothing. So Sir John Templeton, my friend of a lifetime, and Ev Worthington, and a few others, uh, Mike, myself, um, started to think about a forgiveness research campaign. Well, here at Case Western, Julie Exline in psychology was tenured a few years ago for her forgiveness research. There are now about four to 5,000 peer-reviewed research articles on forgiveness in relationship to social capital, physical well-being, mental well-being, and the like. And a lot of it came right out of the forgiveness campaign. So Mike did a wonderful study on interpersonal forgiving and close relations, and the conclusion was that positive emotions, which are related to positive actions, displace negative emotions. So think about it. Now suddenly you can go back to a little bit of Proverbs, kitchen table wisdom, nothing theological about this, just practical stuff. Those who refresh others are themselves refreshed. It begins to make sense. There's something about involving yourself in this kind of pro-sociality that frees you from these negative emotions and allows you to move forward creatively. Well, just by example, think about Jim LaRue. Um, I suppose of late, we think about the Amish. I happen to be the day after those 12 girls were shot in the head in Lancaster County, I happened to be doing grand rounds in psychiatry at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And everybody was in a state of shock because uh, a number of those girls uh, were flighted into Hershey, which is the trauma center for the, for the county. Um, it was amazing. But that very night of the incident, the Amish went to the home of the perpetrator uh, and told the, the, um, the wife and the parents and the children that they bore no grudge against um, uh, this uh, murderer. Um, and then in a remarkable ritual of forgiveness, they raised the schoolhouse down with bulldozers and uh, a la the movie Witness, uh, as a community, they built a beautiful new schoolhouse. It does make a difference, I think, if forgiveness is built into our uh, communities. And that goes to questions of uh, culture uh, and spirituality and so forth. Um, the Hebrews talk about uh, tikkun olam, repairing the world. The rabbis have a great deal to say about the power of forgiveness and reconciliation. Turn to whoever is closest to you right now in this place. And have a confidence that you have the talents, the abilities to manifest love rather than uh, revenge. Uh, what is forgiveness? I'll try a definition. Letting go of a hurt that we tend to rehearse in our minds, locking us into a past while diminishing our life in the now or the present. It's an internal process of the victim getting over ill will and returning to benevolence. Reconciliation. Uh, evolutionarily among non-human primates, forgiveness and reconciliation are deeply intertwined. Forgiveness is part of the movement toward reconciliation. I'll just do one more minute. Uh, game theory all shows us that, in fact, this is the case, that forgiveness is linked with going forward in the game. Of course, there is a kind of fitting guardedness, I forgive you, but I can't forget you. It's interesting how people say that. When you think about the human future, we today ha have every likelihood of destroying ourselves. We have catastrophes galore. I suppose the silver lining of the catastrophic is that it shows us that we really are connected. Because in the wake of a catastrophe, it, we see people doing remarkable things. It brings out the best in us in so many very powerful ways. Hope is an openness to surprises. When you think about Howard Thurman, Benjamin Elijah Mays, Reverend Martin Luther King, Mandela, Tutu, the power of forgiveness and reconciliation is real. And we need to make the most of it uh, because it's now or never. I'll just read one little statement here, and then we'll have some comments. Um, Nelson Mandela was stepping onto the dock of Robben Island, where he would spend decades of his life. The guards were forcing the prisoners to trot up to the prison doors. Mandela refused. In the prison, the warden called Mandela, boy. Look here, he responded. I must warn you. 
I'll take you to the highest authority and you will be poor as a dormouse by the time I finish with you. Captain Gariki backed off. The power of nonviolence uh, is outstanding. Um, my simple point here, uh, forgiveness is not just some fruit of the spirit, as Pope thought, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Sure, spiritual traditions can enhance this human substrate, but the human substrate is very real. Uh, it's not the case that forgiveness is just something that descends from above upon a recalcitrant human nature, but rather forgiveness is very much a part of what it means to be human. It's universal, it's a necessary aspect of successful human existence, and we can extend it, and we need to. So that, uh, that's the message, and I'd be very interested to get your thoughts and comments on, on this. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Hi. Uh, how about a really big forgiveness? Uh, <laughs> those people who, who did 9-11, uh, should we for, forgive them? Should we have forgiven them? Yeah. And, and if so, uh, would our world uh, be, have been a better place or, or, or will be a better place? If we well, I leave that to everybody's reflection. But that's certainly important because uh, our reaction to 9-11 may or may not have been quite fitting in certain respects. Uh, uh, I would say that my institute uh, funded the only major study on the helpers after 9-11. About two weeks after 9-11, I was invited by Reverend Lyndon Harris to St. Paul's Chapel, which is part of Trinity Church. It was right on the precipice of the of the World Trade Center site, but somehow it didn't fall into the into the into the hole, and that's where all the helpers were were living. Uh, they were living on the pews. You had volunteers from all over the country flowing into New York just to serve sandwich and soup at St. Paul's Chapel. And I was standing there with Lyndon, and a little African American woman came in. She somehow got through all the security lines, and she walked up to Lyndon. She said, "Reverend Harris, I saw on TV that somebody hurt their leg. I want to give you my cane." And Reverend Harris Lyndon said, no, no thanks, but she gave it to him anyway, and then she hobbled off. Well, we studied, actually, over three years, the helpers, all the people who were involved uh, in direct ways in 9-11, to see if that kind of transformation uh, would be a permanent factor of their lives, or if they would quickly go back to their same old used-to-be's in this sort of uh, more uh, callous, everyday sense. It turns out that, that about a third of those people who were involved pro-socially around that catastrophe actually did change their lives dramatically. They went into new career lines that were more compassionate and focused on the common good. It's really quite interesting. So that's a reality as well. Yeah. Well, justice is incredibly important. Now, we don't want to trivialize it, and I don't intend to do so. But I would also say that uh, justice without love, without mercy, without the flexibility that makes justice more humane uh, is really an excuse for callousness and, so, and vengeance. And so, uh, I'm not going to take a position on the death penalty. It's not my position to do so, although I, I, I know that Jim uh, uh, LaRue uh, for many years has conscientiously uh, objected to the, to the death penalty. Many countries don't have it. Um, I think the, the, we ought not to nurture vengeance. I just don't think it's a healthy thing to do for anybody. Uh, people think they're going to get a lot out of it. You know, They go and they witness a capital punishment, and they think, ah, now we're going to feel better as a family. Now we're going to get this off our chest. And you know what happens if you look at what's out there? You know, They don't actually feel that way. Um, they, they, they walk out and they're frustrated. You know, it, it didn't do it for them, right? And so to some extent, you know, if you follow this literature, you wonder, wouldn't it be better to create the kinds of 
you know, at the right time, of course, and in a sensitive way, the opportunities as possible for the kind of interaction that would allow for, uh, for forgiveness. Um, I think that's a really interesting possibility. For many years, I did prison ministry at, uh, at uh, Grafton, you know, out near Oberlin. Um, and in fact, I had about 50 lifers reading why good things happen to good people and going through it chapter by chapter. I've got to tell you, some of these people were in, had been in Grafton for 30 or 40 years. They were brilliant. I mean, they've had so much time there to reflect on life. The only group that I thought ever uh, had better things to say about these themes uh, of compassion and, and forgiveness and attentive listening and generativity were cancer survivors. And I walked away from Grafton thinking, you know, there are a lot of people in jail who ought to be out of jail, and there are a lot of people out of jail who ought to be in jail. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to make any conclusive comment, but I really think that um, we, we need to realize that social scientifically, uh, we don't get that much out of the death of perpetrators. We, we, we think we will, but in fact, we don't. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks, Carol. Great. Well, I think we need to do more work in that area, and in fact, not enough has been done connecting this science with the actual day-to-day -day efforts that mediators, people involved in reconciliation uh, uh, do. And for that reason, uh, very distinguished Calvin Sharp, who I've grown to admire immensely as I've known him over the last six or seven months, uh, is working on a, on a major project to bring together uh, people involved professionally in mediation and reconciliation uh, with this whole community of uh, researchers so that we can, in fact, make progress. Uh, to date, I would say that people involved in the field in reconciliation and mediation are really not very uh, well informed or privy to a lot of this uh, uh, research uh, information. I think it would probably be useful to create a kind of dialogue uh, that might, uh, might allow us to move forward in some very interesting ways. Please, before you leave, please, just a, a minute or so before you leave. Uh, my name is Calvin Sharp, and I'm the uh, founding director of, of SISTER, which stands for Center for the Interdisciplinary uh, Study of Conflict and Dispute Resolution. One of the things that uh, is very key to uh, this uh, center, the, the, the term SISTER comes from Proverbs 7-4, which says, say the wisdom, you are my sister. And the idea is that we have a lot to learn about conflict, that is, understanding and responding to conflict from other disciplines. So one might ask the fun, uh, pun first brush, why would you have a bioethicist, positive psychologist, theologian come in and give a lecture about conflict? Or why would you have a Maya Angelou, a poet, give a lecture about uh, conflict. Well, I think you can see from today's lecture about positive emotions, forgiveness, compassion, love, displacing negative emotions and leading toward reconciliation, the connection between uh, some of these other insights that are supplied by other disciplines and effectively dealing with conflict, which is what SISTER is all about. So I really want to uh, applaud uh, Dr. Post for his wonderfully enlightening uh, lecture, uh, sharing some unique insights that I think can help us personally and can help us with this tremendous problem of understanding and responding to conflict. So thank you very much, Stephen. And also, also one final thing. We have a gift for Dr. Post uh, from the law school to help him uh, remember us fondly as we will fondly remember his lecture. It's a very nice clock um, that, uh, if I can get it open, uh, oh, here we go. 
it's a oh, that's what it says oh. is Case Western Reserve uh, University School of Law, September 16, 2008. Stephen Post, sister distinguished interdisciplinary lecturer. Thank you very much, Stephen. And it works. Yeah, and it works. <laughs>